you know, we're doing a lot of writing now. We're doing research on teams. We've actually now created a model of high-performing teams and a definition of team that is a high-performing team uh, collaborates to release the genius of its members and to create the extraordinary together. Welcome to Create New Futures, thought-provoking conversations with leaders, experts, and interesting minds. Join us as we explore ideas and reflect on practices that you can use and apply to create and shape the future. With your host, author and strategy consultant, Aviv Shahar. Welcome to Create New Futures, where we develop conversations with successful leaders to explore how you can create new futures for you and for your organization. This is Aviv, and today I'm speaking with Suzanne Bates. Suzanne is the CEO of Bates, a firm founded with a mission to help leaders influence the world. Suzanne and her team help global companies by bringing differentiated know-how to leadership development and groundbreaking strategies to helping leaders make an impact. Suzanne is the author of five best-selling books, including Speak Like a CEO, Secrets for Commanding Attention and Getting Results, Motivate Like a CEO, Communicate Your Strategic Vision and Inspire People to Act, Discover Your CEO Brand, Secrets for Embracing and Maximizing Your Unique Value as a Leader, and her latest book, All the Leader You Can Be, The Science of Achieving Extraordinary Executive Presence, where she explores the deeper facets that enable leaders to align, inspire, and move people to act. Before launching her consulting firm, Suzanne led a successful career as a television journalist. Her years as an on-air personality with major market television stations put her at the center of major news stories with the opportunity to interview thousands of political leaders, CEOs, business people, authors, and celebrities. She won an AP News Award and was part of a team that won the highest award in journalism. Today, as a recognized expert in business communication and leadership, Suzanne has appeared in hundreds of publications, including the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, and was a guest on countless television programs. I have initially interacted with Suzanne at the Million Dollar Consulting Hall of Fame, and I have found her to be insightful, witty, and penetratingly practical with her approach. And so I'm excited that we get to explore uh, today together. Suzanne, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Uh, oh, Aviv, thank you so much. It's just a privilege to be uh, having a conversation with you today. Thank you. So we are conducting this conversation towards the end of the year. And so I'd like to dive right in and, and ask you for a moment to reflect on, on this last year, 2018, and ask you what, what are you grateful for and um, what, what uh, of all the things you do, because there are so many different endeavors that you lead, what energizes you the most and, and what are you most grateful for? I think if there's an overarching theme to the gratitude that I feel, Aviv, it's gratitude for the journey. And now in my, uh, I don't know how many decades of uh, work uh, in two careers, I think I've become even more um, attuned to what a joy it is to get to take the journey every day. You know, um, Steve Jobs once said, you can't connect the dots forward. You can only connect the dots backward. And that may be something we talk about later. You know, how do you go from television journalism to owning your own company and working with some of the top leaders in the world? But I think um, it, it all makes sense um, sometimes looking in the rearview mirror. And the longer you're on the journey, the more you appreciate the time that you have, uh, you know, to discover who you are as a person 
and sometimes as a leader. And I guess of all the things that I think um, uh, are important to me now, it's the opportunity to continue to learn and grow. So it really is the journey, and the journey is personal and professional, not just, you know, what you achieve in your career, but the relationships you create, uh, the family that you support and love, and all the people in your life who are teachers along the way. Yes. So it's the journey and the opportunity to learn and grow. How do you learn best? What, what are the situations that you find in the day-to-day -day work leading a, a company that enable you to, to learn and, and grow? Well, again, connecting the dots backward, I think that what stimulates learning for me and for our organization is the uh, intent to be innovative and to try new things. So very often when you start down the road, you don't realize a thing you've envisioned or thought you might want to do or created. You don't really know what that's going to mean in terms of what you need to learn to be successful. But that should be part of the fun, and I think that it is. And looking back over the 18 or 19 years that I've had my company, um, inventing it from scratch was very challenging, but also a learning opportunity. When I started my business, I knew nothing about business. Really, I'd been a journalist. I'd never been to business school. I'd never even been a manager. I'd been a on the air uh, anchor and reporter. So I didn't know what I didn't know. And I would say that that Uh, theme carried on in you know the early days of when I um, really decided to build a business um, when we developed new programs we developed assessments uh, we developed I think a different way of looking at uh, leadership and it's not without its challenges launching new products and services and and getting them out into the marketplace and connecting with your ideal buyer and Uh, branding and marketing your company so it stands out. Those are all big challenges that require you to be learning all the time. But to me, again, that's the joy of it. So um, I think it really comes down to uh, accepting and even creating challenges. So we're going to retrace in a little bit into the beginning of your journey, but still in, in the present time, at this point, with, with the kind of success that you've had and the clients that you serve today, when, when you reflect on the portfolio of activities in running your company, what do you find today challenging and what do you find enjoyable in, in the work? Because there is, there is leading your team, and, and there is also delivering to your clients. So when you look at, at the overall, where is the point of challenge and where is the point of, of energy and excitement? And the, sometimes they may be the same, but I'm curious how you'll, you'll respond to that. Yeah. I think when I'm working with, I still do work with clients. I advise and coach clients and work with their teams. And what stimulates me most is being out on the edge. And I don't mean by that taking them where they don't want to go, but really uh, being in a position to uh, listen and understand what they're really trying to accomplish and tapping into my own experiences, uh, any creativity that I feel around that, and also what I've learned over you know, these many years working with leaders. So being out on the cutting edge or the, or the, or the leading edge or just being challenged by uh, creating new ways to deal uh, with client challenges is very stimulating. The other, uh, and you mentioned it, the other part of work that I do truly love and that stimulates me is leading the company. When I started, I was a solo practitioner and now I lead a firm. And I've had to learn how to do what I teach our clients to do. I've had to learn how to build a team and create a strong leadership team, um, get teams of people to work together and focus on uh, the development of our IP, the development of our programs, um, 
to uh, transfer knowledge, you know, to help them learn to do the things that they need, need to do to be successful in our company with our clients. So there's never a day when I get up and I say, wow, I wonder what I'm going to do today. I'm so bored. <laughs> it never happens. I'm just always kind of in a constant state of thinking and imagining and, and, uh, and growing. So it's, it's the thinking and, and the imagining and the growing. And I'm listening to what you're describing, this first feature that you identified of being prepared to step time and again into your own cutting edge on the edge of what you know and have experienced together with clients to look at sometimes to look at new problems and sometimes to look at old problems in a new way. Uh, unless, unless we are prepared to step into that space where we cannot operate merely from a place of ready-made answers, this work cannot be done at the level and, and the quality that, that I know you, you deliver. So that, that daring, that courage, and, and that um, entrepreneurial spirit in, in yourself beyond even just lead, leading the firm, but in the moment with the client is where some of the most differentiating and exciting ideas, I, I imagine, em emerge for you in, in the day-to-day -day work. Well, it's true. Uh, you cannot approach the work that we do with uh, senior executives and some of the best companies in the world with ready-made answers. And that isn't to say that there isn't um, wisdom that isn't tried and true. Uh, but, um, but you do have to be willing to examine your own ways of looking at things and help others examine their ways of looking at things. Um, and I'll, I mean, I'll just give you one example. Early on in my business, I was asked by a, a large financial institution to work with some of their newer client-facing salespeople. And I didn't know anything about sales, but what I was what I was doing is I was observing how they were approaching their clients. And this will sound familiar to many of you, but they were coming to their meetings with a book, a book of their products and services that started with uh, an iconic image on the front page. And they would walk through the book and I would sit there and think, what does this have to do with the client? And so by asking myself that question, and feeling the frustration of it. So I think you have to feel the tension in the moment of looking at something that is, trying to figure out what's not working, and designing another approach. And in that case, I finally, in frustration really, got up to the whiteboard and I drew a line down the center of the board. And I asked that salesperson to tell me what was I think it was his agenda for the meeting, and so he told me. And then I asked him to put that aside and asked me what was the agenda for his client. In other words, what were the questions and, and skepticism and things that they were wondering? Well, it was a completely different list. And that was uh, the beginning for me of starting to create tools that help people better understand how to communicate with their audiences. And we've been using that tool we call audience agenda for many years. But I think the point of it is that um, you can't come with ready-made answers. And if you show up uh, as an advisor or a consultant, uh, it, you know, with the same old answers, um, you won't last very long. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. What inspired you in recent times to focus on executive presence? And, and what is actually, uh, how do you define executive presence? Because I know that's some of your, that's part of your latest work. It is. Well, it was another story of frustration, actually. Uh, you know, for many years, because I had worked in television, we were asked by our client companies if we could work with a leader on executive presence. It turns out, I learned later, that executive presence is the number two reason why leaders seek coaching. At the time, I, you know, I would say, well, sure, you know, we can work on that, but what does it mean to you? And people would answer, well, I'm not sure, but I know it when I see it. Well, that's a pretty frustrating answer for a leader, male or female, 
if you give them the feedback, they need to work on executive presence and you don't know what you mean or you can't put your finger on it, there's not much they can do about it. Still, I was kind of walking away from the topic. I felt, frankly, that it might be a little shallow for the kind of work we were doing in helping leaders bridge the gap from strategy to execution. But one um, uh, one day about five years ago, I attended a conference in New York. The topic of, of the noon keynote was executive presence. And the speaker was revealing some results of a global survey she'd done of Uh, CEOs and senior executives on what they thought executive presence was. Well, it wasn't so much the content of her presentation that intrigued me. It was the fact that everyone who was out at the coffee machines and in the lobby came back in, sat down. There were no seats in the house, standing room only, and you could have heard a pin drop. And I thought the very thing that I'd been running away from, I needed to run toward. I needed to understand it better. So that was uh, really the beginning of our journey to doing a, creating a science-based model and assessment of executive presence. So we researched everything from uh, leadership and management theory to communication theory, social action theory, psychology. We looked at philosophy and ethics because we wanted to build character into the model of presence. And where we ended up was is the definition you asked about is the qualities of a leader that engage, align, inspire, and move people to act. So let's slow this one. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please go. Let's slow this one down and and let's take each of those verbs and and offer the significance of why they are part of that definition, please. Yeah. So engagement is something, of course, that's talked about a lot in business. I don't think it's still very well understood. There are a lot of assessments uh, or surveys, employee surveys that try to get at this question of whether people are engaged. And in our definition, we're not just talking about engaging the people who work with you and for you, although those are very important people in your life. We're also talking about engaging uh, your clients, engaging uh, influencers, engaging the media, Everywhere you go, you have opportunity as a leader to engage people and get their best efforts. So engagement is really about uh, getting people to give above and beyond. It's tapping into that uh, that uh, feeling that they want to have, that they're, they ha- there's something they can contribute to that's greater than themselves. So that's how I think about engagement. Uh, Align is also very important in leadership because when you think about it, uh, a leader's job isn't to do the work of the organization. You can't. All you can do is align the rest of the organization, the people on your team and others who are connected to your projects and your initiatives. All you can do is align them to get the work of the organization done. So that's why you hear so much about alignment today. Uh, it's not that it's new. The question is, how do we get people aligned? And that was in the model of executive presence that we created. And there are 15 behaviors or facets that we measure. What we were seeking to do is identify those specific leadership qualities that, again, engage, align, inspire, and mobilize people, get them to take action. Right. And, you know, there's a lot to that, right? So that's why there are 15 behaviors that we measure. Right, and, and it's beautiful that it, it um, lands with mobilize because unless it is translated to action, then um, it's, it's an intellectual. It, it's not something that, that, that is actualized. And, and presence, in the way you describe presence, is, is about mobilizing the people in, in your presence and, and perhaps even people that are not in your presence at that point in time because I imagine that part of that is to do with how you can create a move, a broader movement in the organization and ultimately inspire a similar kind of presence in, in the people that you lead. Yes, and that's a good point, Aviv, because when you model that kind of leadership, it's contagious. So not only are you an engaging, inspiring leader who mobilizes others, but people model that behavior and they engage their teams. 
so it is uh, because it's behavioral. Also, these are things that we can learn. We're not talking about qualities of a leader that are innate to them. Uh, we're talking about qualities that they can develop. It doesn't mean we don't all have strengths and gaps, but the idea of even having a model of executive presence is to answer the question, how do I achieve greater presence? How do I become a leader that mobilizes people and makes things happen in my organization? So in your book, you discuss character. substance, and style. Help me understand how these three ideas bridge into this conversation of, of presence and the engage, align, inspire, and mobilize. I think of presence, we think of presence as the multi-faces of an individual. So starting with the person that you see, that you experience, which is an important part of presence. But then continuing on to the deeper levels of the person, the substance of the person and the character of the person. So we think of style, that more readily observable behavior, as the qualities that enable us to execute. So those are qualities like intentionality and interactivity, the way we communicate with other people, the assertiveness we use in the Um, engaging other people in constructive conflict, that kind of thing, the things that enable teams to get things done. The substance dimension, which is you know probably self-evident, you know what we're talking about here, they're really the cultivated qualities of mature leadership. So the things that we learn as we have experience in leadership specifically. And that goes to our credibility. So style is about execution. Substance is about, credibility and character those qualities uh, uh, like authenticity and integrity and concern go to whether people trust us so you can see just or hear by the definitions the kinds of things that we're talking about that we've broadened the definition many people the way many people think about executive presence from the simply like presentation skill or charisma or energy or uh, savvy. We've broadened that definition to include the things that we actually know from science and research are the ones that engage, inspire, align, and mobilize action. You have really uh, embraced or brought into the equation the whole person conversation. And I imagine yeah. that people that engage uh, with those practices and, and learning and, and development, one of, the, one of the key discoveries is, is to have to show up with presence. You need to also learn to be present. And I imagine that people that, that discover how they can be present in the moment, This is a something that they then can take to their life beyond their role as a leader uh, and bring to their personal lives uh, in terms of of how they are as a spouse, as a parent, as a as a human being, anywhere they go. You're so right. I think uh, one of the things that I've heard from leaders again and again is that these are really qualities of a person. I mean, they're important to leadership. And they also uh, can define how you are in the world. And, you know, Aviv, since I have had an opportunity to get to know you over, you know, a, a several years, one of the things I've noticed about you is how present you are. Even the way you ask questions is such an indication, not only that you've come prepared to the discussion, but you're also very in the moment listening and listening. Uh, thinking about what's really interesting about what another person has said. And when you can do that, we actually, I mean, there's, there are a few things we measure in our model that go to that. Resonance is one of the key ones. So if you think about resonance uh, like, a, like, a, like an instrument, really, you know, when we're resonant with one another, uh, when music plays, you know, there's kind of a vibration between us. In resonance and leadership is connecting with other people. Uh, but it's that ability to be attentive and attuned and responsive, and not only to what people are saying, but what you suspect by what you see and hear and just know from experience they are feeling. 
so thoughts and also feelings and emotions. It's all data, right? We, you know, I know people have heard that expression, emotions are data too, but being completely attuned to the entire situation, uh, wherever you are, and not just in the room, but anticipating how your decisions, your actions might affect others who you don't even see. So you can imagine how valuable that is to a senior executive leading a large company who may or may not ever meet all the people who work in his or her organization. That's beautiful. So you really expanded and redefined uh, presence, executive presence, to include the ability to attune to the, the field of resonance, which mm-hmm. is great. It's absolutely great. So, so let me, at this point, trace to the beginning because as you said in, in your opening, and I said in the introduction, you really have done two, in been involved in two completely different careers. Perhaps we will discover in a minute that they are not so different. But <laughs> let me first ask, how, do, how did you get into journalism? What was the, the journey that brought you into journalism and then into uh, working with some major uh, television stations in, in some of the, the largest uh, markets in the country? Well, when I was in college in the 70s, um, women were just uh, beginning to enter the world of television journalism. So at the time, Jane Pauley had just started on the Today Show. And in most television markets, there were no women anchors and very few women reporters. So I say that only to um, kind of set the scene Uh, I had not imagined myself doing that in high school. In college, I thought I was going to go to law school, but I needed to declare a major. And it was something as simple as my my college advisor suggesting, based on what she'd observed about me, that journalism might be of interest. And when I started taking the courses, I really did enjoy. I enjoyed the writing. I enjoyed the discovery process, you know, going out and covering a story and um, just, you know, it was a lot of fun, frankly. And in fact, I remember asking my dad, who also was an attorney, uh, and I think probably hoped I'd come back home someday and take over his law practice. After I'd been uh, working for a couple of years, I had, you know, was thinking of going back to law school. And he he said to me, honey, you don't want to be a lawyer. (laughs) You don't want to push papers around a desk all day. You know, there I was. I was out, you know, with a camera covering news stories at the center of the action. It was really a lot of fun, especially, you know, when I was 21, 22 years old. So, uh, but, and the other context for that is it wasn't so long after Watergate. And many, many people went into journalism at that time um, really thinking of it as a mission. So for me, it was a mission. It was a mission to, uh, to uncover uh, the truth about what was happening, whether that was in government or cover politics or, you know, I mean, I covered everything. I covered crime. I did investigative work and I did features too. So, uh, so and that I think is where I really began also to understand how much I loved learning. So, you know, the, the, the allure of it really was that every day I got up and, and, and uh, it was different. You know, when I got to work, I didn't know what I'd be doing that day. And the challenge was to quickly assimilate what you were learning and translate that by six o'clock because the camera goes on at six, whether you're ready or not. Translate that by 6 p.m. into a story that, uh, you know, had a point. And so I, I loved it. I loved working under a deadline. I loved the team I was working with. It was very, very exciting. What's a memorable um, formative story or interview or a moment on camera that comes to mind? Mm. Well, it was some years ago. Uh, I was working in Philadelphia at WCAU-TV, which then was the CBS affiliate. And uh, maybe a few of the f- folks listening uh, today will recall this story, but it is, has been a long time. It was a big story in Philadelphia when it happened. There was a group called MOVE. It was kind of a counterculture group 
they had taken up residency in a home in West Philadelphia, and they had become very disruptive. And this has been going on for months. And uh, the the city, the mayor, the fire chief, the police chief, uh, coordinated a plan that was uh, somewhat secret to get them out of the house. And it turned into a catastrophe. The um, They bombed the house mm. and it burned down 40 or 50 homes in West Philadelphia. So that was a big, big story. As a matter of fact, it was a story that I was part of a team that won a Columbia DuPont Award for. So I think what I remember most is just, um, of course, it was a tragic story, but uh, but also the the opportunity to work with a team. So it wasn't just in the individual effort. It was the team effort because, you know, we were, you know, covered every aspect of it. I was at City Hall. I had colleagues who were down, you know, at the scene. Uh, one of my colleagues, a cameraman, took, you know, risked his life to get the pictures in the house across the street. So it was really quite an extraordinary experience. And, you know, I think it, it, it got me back in touch, not only with the mission, but I think it helped me understand the value of team too, which, you know, comes into play later in my career. Right, right. What, what are some of those uh, key transferable skills that were catalyzed in you as you are entering this space and, and building the, the discipline of needing to translate and converge from a complex story to something that can be digestible by 6 p.m. What, how would you describe those skills that, that I imagine then become valuable in, in many other settings? Mm. Yeah, so many. And yet when I was leaving television, I doubted that. <laughs> I wasn't sure that what I had learned in television would have any meaning at all in the business world. And I, you know, looking back now, that's, uh, you know, it's astounding that I didn't see that, that how many uh, of the skills that I had had the opportunity to develop would transfer. But, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, what a reporter has to do, and I've named some of those things, but um, you have to be a very quick study. You have to be an observe, uh, an uh, observant person. You have to be creative and agile, uh, quick on your feet, quick to think. Um, you have to be able to obviously express yourself in words, whether in writing or, you know, on the air. Uh, you have to be able to ad lib. Uh, you have to be able to work with other people. And you have to be able to tell a story. So those are just a few of the skills. Uh, I think also having to work under deadline and deliver something of value, uh, you know, in a, in a relatively short period of time. Um, those are all very, very valuable skills in business. And frankly, they really aren't taught <laughs> in business. Right. So right. Yeah, right. You, can, you can learn them through experience, but um, you know, writing is a, is, is a hugely important skill in business. And yet, I think there's a dearth of good writing in business and uh, good communication, which you know, is the number one challenge I think in just about every organization so you know coming in and understanding those things and 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 having those be almost intuitive was also interesting not intuitive but just so second nature I actually uh, one of the interesting experiences I had was to try to deconstruct how I had learned to do what I had learned to do because that was the value for others so for example how to tell a story um, I developed a a storytelling formula and also a formula for finding and developing original stories. But I did that, you know, I, 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 nobody taught me that when I went into journalism, I just learned, right? So, so I had to create a process, which was actually really fun. And we, we have taught that storytelling methodology for 10 years to thousands and thousands of leaders who've come through our Speak Like a CEO program and been in our coaching programs. So this is really a bit like the calligraphy story that Steve Jobs uh, described <laughs> uh, because yeah. you, you did not know that how will these skills and learning show up later in what you will later do. And, and I suppose this is a proof point to your, your first comment about a journey. The journey is often wiser than we are as we take the journey. And you were equipped by 
uh, very special skills or, or very vital skills to the work you will do later. Yes. And, you know, if there's, there's so, so much wisdom in what you just said, I, I think sometimes people don't take the time to reflect back on what they have learned and how, they, uh, how that does apply to their lives today or how it can help them be better leaders, uh, especially when you're talking about leadership. Um, you know, if we don't take the time, I think, to reflect on our experiences, then we can't benefit from those experiences and we can't uh, recreate it or help others uh, to benefit from our experiences. What was then the decision process that led you to say, I'm, I'm leaving this space uh, of <laughs> TV work and, and television work and I'm going to do something else? What was that process like and did you know immediately what you were going to do? Yeah, I'd say it, it was about a two-year process, and it was a much more practical, uh, I think, thinking process for me. Uh, the, the, the lifestyle of television is really fun when you're younger. It isn't so conducive to family life. Mm. So that was one challenge for me. You're either on television at 11 o'clock at night or at 5 o'clock in the morning, and either way, you're not on the same schedule as your family. Uh, I also, you know, I had other ambitions. I think, uh, you know, I'm just going to say financially, I felt like uh, I might be able to translate all that I had learned into creating more wealth, more financial wealth and, you know, wealth in other ways, more discretionary time, uh, time to pursue, you know, other things that I loved. So, uh, you know, it was hard to leave a career that I had loved and I still say, I, you know, I loved every minute of it, but I really, I felt deeply that um, at the kind of the midpoint of my career life, it was time to not just to make a change, but really to shake things up, go on a new journey, discover. And I didn't know this then, but uh, I, I discovered so much more about myself when I made the decision um, to change careers. It was say astounding more. to me. Yeah, say yeah. more about that discovery, please. Yeah. Well, you know, first, as I mentioned, I didn't know anything about business. Um, I didn't know anything about selling. I didn't know anything about marketing. Um, you know, there, I mean, everything that I do today, really, uh, I didn't know a whole lot about. I, mean, I had instincts. I had the desire to learn. And I also got connected to, over time, to communities of people who I learned from like the one that you and I belong to uh, in the Million Dollar um, Consulting Group. Uh, so uh, along the way, I, I'd say I, I, it was, I, I'm just going to say I amazed myself at what I was able to learn. Sometimes I tell people the story at the, my first year in business, I was still solo. I had maybe uh, one or two part-time people working with me. And uh, my accountant stopped by. I was working from home and he said, hey, you know, let's talk about the year. Great year. You're making some money. I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm on my way, I think. And he said, it's just one thing I want to talk to you about. I said, what's that? And he said, accounts receivable. And I said, great. What are accounts receivable? <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't know. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, now I tell people I've earned an on-the-job PhD in how to make sure we collect the money um, that, you know, we have earned. But, you know, I just, today, I you know, sat down with my CFO and we went over our year, our annual, uh, uh, you know, uh, profit and loss and our balance sheet. And, you know, I can read it all now. And I sure have had the opportunity to learn so much. But it isn't just about the mechanics of business. I think the, the deeper learnings are about what you're capable of. And, you know, I often tell people I think it's a really, really good idea if you ever have the opportunity to, well, if not change careers, take risks, you know, leap into something you don't know how to do because that confidence that you get from um, starting something new and doing it relatively successfully is like no other kind of confidence. Mm. That's beautiful. It's, it's the learning, again, that, that you find when you uh, put yourself on the edge of yourself, on the edge of what you know. Did, did mm -hmm. you 
write your first book, Speak Like a CEO, right as you started and use that to launch your practice? Or that came a little later? It came a little later. I started the business in January of 2001. And I, you know, again, wasn't really, my imagination probably wasn't big enough. Uh, I never thought of myself as a book author. But uh, I, I joined a, a professional association, the National Speakers Association, where many of the members had written books. And I, I saw uh, just by, you know, through their stories and the success that they were achieving, how valuable it would be to have a book. I knew I wanted to write a book about business communication, but gosh, is that a boring subject, right? I mean, business communication, come on. So I had to give some thought for a while uh, to who my audience was. In other words, who did I really care about writing to? Who did I enjoy working with? And what did I really have to say to them? And, um, you know, at the time I was starting to work with uh, many more senior executives in large companies. and. Uh, but I was also taking any, any work that came along. So it wasn't like I'd really, at, until that time, defined what I was passionate about. But upon reflection and, you know, talking with people who, you know, were very helpful to me, who understood things like branding and book writing, I zeroed in on, on um, the CEO as the audience. And, you know, I would extend that to the senior executive as the audience. It just was something I, that fascinated me. I just think um, what makes senior executives and CEOs successful is um, in many ways so elusive. And they're, they're great CEOs and they're um, CEOs that, you know, lose their way or never find their way. And so the, I think that it was once I, once I hit on that, the title of the book, Speak Like a CEO, uh, just kind of fell into my lap. And, you know, there's another process of discovery. I, I think it's a mistake to try to force things to happen, but you still have to strive, right? So you have to aim for something. You know, I'm going to write a book, but you also have to be thoughtful about what you want to write about or, or where you want to engage your mind and, and, pour, and, and, and pour your creativity into. Because um, writing a book, uh, you know, as you know, as many people know, or, or, you know, a bigger project like that requires every ounce of your uh, mental and and physical and emotional um, focus. So right. you've got to have a really good reason to do it. <laughs> right. And, and it's in the way you're describing the process, it, it, it is clear and, and evident mm -hmm. that the, there is a, a kaleidoscope-like moving Venn diagram where you're looking to find a convergence zone where you have a differentiated experience and unique know-how and you are able to address a particular a unique need in the marketplace, and one that you happen to be interested and perhaps passionate and energized by, and that in the process will lead you to creating something that you want to create for yourselves and for the people you, you engage with. So it, it is a, a moving Venn diagram of not just two, but perhaps three or four or five different vectors. And I, I think, I believe, based on my experience and certainly from what I've heard from you, that part of the process of writing a book is actually clarifying those questions for you because it forces you into that kind of laser focus uh, inquiry and also uh, specifically what you will choose to leave out uh, and then what you will include in, in the framing that you offer uh, to the marketplace. Well, that describes the process beautifully. I love the visual of the kaleidoscope, and it is a Venn diagram with exactly, as you say, probably four or five different vectors uh, that all have to come together. And you have to be both patient and impatient in trying to bring that all into focus. Uh, you know, you have to be driven enough to keep seeking the answers uh, to finding that focus and, uh, and then also allow it to happen. The writing of a book is really the, it's, it's writing the answers to questions. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you don't always have the answers. You don't right. always have the answers when you start. I mean, I, you know, I write to learn. Yes. 
Yes, mm-hmm. I know that very well. That's my process. I have no idea what I'm going to say <laughs> next, but I frame the question and I, and I write to explore and discover um, where my answer uh, will, will appear. And I, I sometimes call this the, the mental bungee jump. Your, your third book, the focus of your third book is, is the brand of the CEO. Looking at it from today, what would you say are some of the most prevalent first misconceptions about discovering and developing your brand as a CEO? Oh. And, and what are some quick tips that you can share to help CEOs discover their brand? Well, you know, if you think about a, the definition of a brand generally, a brand is how people think of you when you're not there. Mm-hmm. And so how people think about a leader when they're not there is a distillation of what they've observed about them, their actions and their behaviors and their uh, values, if they know those, and the impact they have on others. And so I think sometimes brand also is CEO brand or executive brand is another area that is often treated um, I don't know, kind of as shallow, uh, uh, you know, it, people often think of it as, oh, well, what I'm wearing, you know, my executive suit or, you know, how I show up or again, how I present. But a uh, brand uh, like presence is really the sum of how people experience you. So how leaders convey that is really challenging, especially in large organizations or if they're standing on you know, a big stage, an industry stage, a global stage, and I mean sta- stage figuratively as well as um, really. Uh, so when you're standing on a big stage, many people will never shake your hand. They will never meet you, but they, they know what you stand for or they should know what you stand for. And, you know, we see this play out all the time in politics and in business. And people's ideas of a CEO or an executive brand can change, um, just like their uh, view of a company brand can change. And very often with a CEO, those are interchangeable. So when you see companies getting into trouble, as you know, we see now some of the most recent um, you know, stories or themes are around data breaches or da- privacy and security, uh, you know, fraud is you know, perennial, um, uh, you know, not telling the truth. You know, those, are, those are perennial themes. And uh, they, the brand of the company and the brand of the CEO are really um, interchangeable for most people. So, you know, it's very important if you go back to executive presence and some of the qualities we were talking about in presence that are important, like integrity and authenticity, very, very important for leaders to be real with people and to be sincere and to be not just have moral integrity, but behavioral integrity and stand for something. Because when it comes right down to it, that's uh, what people notice and that's what they remember. Right, and, and being real and being sincere begins with self-awareness and, and with knowing yourself. And I imagine you, you do work with senior executives and, and CEOs where that is still a big part of the journey. It, it's coming to discover who actually you are and what do you truly believe in is this part of the the coaching and facilitation and and mentoring that you offer and how do you engage with those type of inquiries yes i think you know there are some leaders who know themselves very well and that may be one of the reasons they've risen to the top they 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 reflect on their experiences and and they probably tell stories and they they share a lot about their values it doesn't mean they don't need to refine that further as a you know, step on a larger stage, but they're essentially aware. There are other leaders for a variety of reasons who haven't gotten in touch with that yet, I would say. And there are a number of reasons for that. Some people are just very private, so they don't like to disclose much about themselves and they don't realize the power that um, appropriate self-disclosure has in helping people connect with you as a human being. And, you know, some people just really have been, you know, driving, 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 haven't really ever taken the time to examine what their lives are about or what they care about, what they're passionate about, what matters to them, 
uh, you know, what they stand for. Uh, but that is something you can uh, learn. Mm. So I would say, you know, with those kinds of, with, with leaders who are in, find themselves in that situation, I think that one of the ways to help, um, you know, on the process, in the process of self-discovery is to tell some of your stories, you know, to examine your life's experiences and say, what did I learn from that? And the arc of the leadership story that we teach is, you know, what was the situation? What was the conflict? What was the uh, moment where that all uh, came to, you know, a head? Uh, what, how did it resolve? And then what did you learn from the experience and how does that apply to others or the universal theme? So if you can look at things that have happened in your life and say, Hmm, that, yeah, that really was a challenge, but get beyond the challenge and, and, and the difficulties you faced and reflect on how it resolved and what you learned and what you can share with others. That makes you a very, very powerful leader because you have a North Star, you have a compass, you, you, know, you know how you got there, you might know why you're there, and you can share your values with others. That's a beautiful uh, tool and, and a choreography uh, process choreography and, and thought choreography. What, um, what are you finding right now at this time are some of the main challenges and issues that clients are asking for help with? I mean, there are obviously the, the perennial issues. You, you just listed some of them, but is there anything that, that's prime when you look at, reflect on the last year or two, uh, and and uh, the kind of challenges that CEOs and clients you you help uh, bring to the table. Yeah, I can think of two or three that are uh, that that seem to be even more prevalent than they were. And and you know the first one probably won't surprise you, and that's the busyness of our mm-hmm. lives. Yeah, I, I think you know whenever we write a story about managing your life, managing your time. Um, saying no to things or knowing when to say yes. Those are the articles that people download and read. And that's just one, I think, leading indicator to me of how people are really struggling to manage. It's not just the workload, but uh, the pressures of a 24-7, uh, you know, communication and, and connection with other people, uh, the demands, what's expected of us today is really uh, greater and we have to process faster. We, we have to get more done and, and there's a never ending as everyone knows. There's, an, there's, there are no boundaries unless you create them yourself. So the best leaders I know are very good at the things that we all know are important to do, like delegating, but also deleting things and, uh, and just not doing them or delaying them until there's the right time so that they can do the most important things. So that, it, it, even though it's always been a challenge for people, I just, I don't know anybody today who isn't talking about the challenge of managing their, their calendars and their lives. Yes. Um, maybe one other, yeah, maybe one other that I think comes up a lot is, um, you know, uh, we get rewarded, and this is, a, this is particularly about leadership, People get promoted, men and women get promoted into higher levels of leadership because they get things done. And there's been a lot written about that. Um, One way to refer to it is as the hero leader. So the hero leader, uh, no matter what the odds, uh, takes things into his or own hands and gets it done, Uh, sometimes at a price uh, to themselves and others. there's a lot more attention now to how do we work in teams. And I really believe that the work of business gets done in teams. And the hero leader is certainly valuable. You always want to have and be the kind of person who can take a situation by the horns, uh, encourage others, uh, you know, move things forward and get things done. But you can't do it alone. And, you know, that I think harkens back to the story I told you about my experience in, in Philadelphia. You know, the, the most gratifying um, experience I had in almost 20 years of journalism was working on a team and doing something great. Uh, 
And I think, um, you know, we're doing a lot of writing now. We're doing research on teams. We've actually now created a model of high-performing teams and a definition of team that is a high-performing team uh, collaborates to release the genius of its members and to create the extraordinary together. So, you know, if it, when, when organizations, when people embrace the power of team, they get so much done and it's so much, it's so, it's so, so much more joyful to do the work. It has been one of the greatest fascination uh, of life and of a um, space that I've observed for many, many years, that this idea of high performing teams. And we see these experiences in the sports world. We see this in the arts and, and certainly in business. So, that this is a, a, a fascinating space to, to explore and, and develop. And you spoke earlier about this moment in time when you realized that you were going to grow a larger firm and that involved teaching other people what you intuitively uh, did yourself and that uh, demanded you uh, to reverse engineer some of the, the, those processes. What, what are some of the, the other lessons and important realizations from fostering a team, from transferring and, and conveying to others the kind of experience and know-how that you intuitively uh, developed yourself and really building a rigor and a conscious practice around this? That's, that must be... Mm -hmm. A both inspiring but sometimes frustrating journey. So I'm, I'm curious how <laughs> would you describe that. Yeah, well, I really do love to take things apart and and then um, create a process. So and a rigorous process. So the part of the the learning and conveying of knowledge that I've always uh, enjoyed and probably has come through and some of the other things we've talked about is that. So what is our sales process? You know, I went, I wrote a sales playbook for our organization based on what I'd learned about the stages of the sale. And we teach that now, uh, you know, some, you know, things that are out there, you know, that others teach too, like consultative selling and that I embraced learning that what I, what I am not that good at is being patient. Mm. So I think that leadership is, if you're a leader, like I am, who's, um, driving and um, maybe lacks some restraint at times. Um, the hardest thing in the world, especially with your own team, is to respect the learning journey of others and still push people to get there. I don't, I don't find it challenging with clients uh, because I'm in a role. But one of the things I discovered about myself is that I wasn't nearly as patient with my own team. So that's been, you know, a challenging journey when you, you know, when you think about the fact that, again, as a leader, you can't do the work, you know, others have to do the work of the organization. Um, the learning journey is different for everybody. And um, sometimes the way they're learning isn't working. Um, and then sometimes what you need them to learn, they're not going to learn. And so you have to, you know, be observant about that, too. See, I'm also somebody who really believes in the potential of others. So that is both a blessing and a curse because um, I, I do invest a lot of time in developing people and I give them a lot of chances. Sometimes that's to the detriment of the organization if on the, on the occasion, and I would say it's occasional, not all the time, but on the occasion you have somebody who's not really contributing what we need them to contribute. Um, it's hard for me to face that. And we can waste time, right? So, and I know those are kind of perennial challenges for anybody who's a leader of any organization. But um, I think acknowledging that is really important. Right. That, that disclosure that it's more difficult to practice internally what we sometimes practice when we are with clients is probably true for many people. I, I know for myself. So right there, there, there is a learning Suzanne, if you look back at the entire journey in journalism and later in building a firm, a consulting firm, 
if you needed to, if you could change one thing, what would that be? Boy, that's a tough question. It's a great question, isn't it? I mean, the easy answer is I wouldn't change a thing because any, <laughs> right? Any, any single thing that changed um, would have, t you know, could potentially taken my life in a different direction. Uh, you can't change the challenges that are, that are put in front of you. Um, you, you it, the ones that you, you know, don't control, you have to accept those and deal with them. And life is filled with challenge. Uh, so, you know, maybe your response to things, I think um, maybe the, maybe the one thing I might change is to more readily recognize when a challenge is a challenge and uh, not resent the challenge, but embrace the challenge as difficult as it is. And even if it creates, you know, tears and fear and angst and sleepless nights or, you know, what, what all those things that happen to all of us, there's a purpose to that. And um, that's why we're here. Yes. <laughs> so yes. I probably wouldn't change a thing. Very nice. Um, if you were to lose all that you know and keep only one or two ideas or one or two capabilities or one or two practices, uh, which would those be? I'd say probably um, the ability to appreciate and have gratitude and the ability to learn. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you, Suzanne, uh, for this uh, journey with you today. As we bring this uh, to lending, and you have already said a lot here, is there any other parting wisdom uh, you'd offer to people listening to Create New Futures? Well, thank you for a wonderful interview, Aviv. You're just one of the most thoughtful uh, people I've ever met, and I am grateful for this conversation. And I would say that You know, when I've observed learning and growth uh, in, in the work that we do, we do, you know, some, we do group learning, a lot of that kind of thing. And there's always more learning when people are talking. There's always more learning when people are sharing. Uh, and when they choose to open up and share more of themselves, there's even more learning. I mean, we have something we call wisdom sharing circles in our executive presence program where people look at uh, some of the things they're striving to learn and they, in a very closed process, so it's a safe process, I guess, um, they share what they're trying to learn and they solicit advice from others, from their experiences. And, um, you know, we just don't have enough time in our lives or we don't take the time to do that or we aren't, don't find ourselves in, I think, safe settings where we can share those things. And that's why conversation is so important. So I would say, Thank you for this conversation. And, uh, you know, keep having conversations. Yeah, thank you so much because this last comment uh, brings to, to my mind that um, part of leadership really is giving people permission to have these conversations and, and also bringing to the table the kind of safety and know-how So thank you for this uh, and, and for all the good work you're doing because as, as you, I think, declared in the mission of the company to, to make an impact on the world, you are making an impact through the, the work and the way you, you touch other people. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Aviv. Here we are. We've landed this Create New Futures journey and it's your time to take action to create your new future. Here are a few steps you can take this week. First, learn to say no. As Suzanne offered, in the busyness of these times, to be truly impactful, you must focus. And to apply yourself to your priorities, you need to be able to say no. You also need to effectively know when to delegate, when to delete, and when to delay. Saying yes fully to what matters implies saying no and or not now to other priorities. Second, build your own executive presence. Suzanne defined executive presence 
as the behaviors and qualities of leaders that engage, align, inspire, and move people to act. When you engage others and provide them the opportunity and the reason to give more of themselves, you fortify them with meaning and with purpose. There is a great sense of liberation and empowerment that people find at the point of alignment when they feel and experience a direct line of sight from their effort and contribution to the greater purpose they are working towards. That quality of alignment is inspiring and mobilizing for all of us to bring forward our best. Third, consciously and deliberately cultivate gratitude for your journey. Appreciate your learning and growth. Gratitude is a muscle you can develop by practice. I have discovered that we can each choose to go to the gratitude gym. In the gratitude gym, we practice the gratitude muscles by finding the small wins and by learning to appreciate the small successes. The big successes of living are made out of the many small moments of overcoming challenge and from moments of creativity and from moments when, as Suzanne painted, you explore openly your own edge beyond what you already know. Learn to say no, build your presence, and exercise the gratitude muscle. One more thing. You can reach me directly by phone and on email to explore how we can help you and your team create your new future. See you next time.